Good evening all, and welcome. Have you ever felt like someone's watching you? Stalking you, perhaps? Could it be that they might want to capture you and sell you off to the highest bidder? I sincerely hope this never happens to any of you. But for now, check behind you. Make sure no one's watching and get comfortable to let the darkness take control. In early 2007, I was freshly 18 and newly married, living in Fort Polk, Louisiana, while my husband was training at Fort Benning. I was born and raised in Alaska, so living in the continental US was a vastly new experience for me. My husband had a weekend off, though he was not allowed to leave the base. So we bought a Greyhound bus ticket for me to visit him and meet the soldiers he became friends with. I had never been on a Greyhound bus before, but I was excited to drive through the South and see new places and have my own little adventure. Sure, plenty of creeps bothered me on the bus and at the stations, but I still had interesting conversations, met new people, and generally enjoyed the experience. Regardless of the time, each station we stopped at was open and offered food, outlets for charging, and bathrooms. So when we arrived in Columbus, Georgia at about 2am, I expected the station to be open. It wasn't. Everyone else who ended their journey there had a ride waiting for them. And suddenly, I was alone outside a locked building in the middle of downtown Columbus, full dark and terrified. I didn't really know what to do, and my phone was nearly dead from the long last leg of travel. I thought about walking to a gas station, but I had no idea which direction to go in, and I couldn't see any nearby lit buildings. I truly expected the station to be open, thinking I would stay there for a bit while my phone charged and I had something to eat and could have access to a phone book so I could call a cab. All I had was an old sign hanging on the side of the building with incomplete phone numbers for taxi companies. The numbers had faded, been scrapped off and defaced. There was only one complete phone number and it was handwritten in Sharpie at the top of the list. Better than nothing, right? Wrong. I called the number, and a guy answered, casual and sleepy, asking who I was. I apologised, explaining I was trying to call a cab. When the guy perked up immediately and said, Oh yeah, that's me. I'm on my way. My phone died ten minutes after I made the call, and it was another 15 minutes before the guy showed up in a traditional looking yellow taxi. I noticed the cab wasn't marked, no logo, number rates, anything. But it had that taxi light thing on the top and in my young naive mind seemed totally legit. He waved me over, I got in and asked him to take me to Fort Benning, finally feeling some relief. The doors auto-locked, and I will never forget the first thing he said to me. He was silent until we got onto a main road and said, Did you really think it was a good idea to call a number written in Sharpie? I froze. In retrospect, no. It wasn't the best idea I'd ever had. But I had so few options and I didn't want to be stranded in a huge foreign city in the middle of the night. I don't know what else I could have done. After a minute, I tried to laugh it off and hoped he didn't notice I was shaking. I reached for my phone, remembering it was dead, and realized that if something happened to me, no one would know that I even made it to Georgia. Staring at me in the rearview mirror, the driver told me what was going to happen. There's no use getting to Benning this early. 
The post hotel isn't even open. Drive around with me for a while, hang out, and I won't even charge you. I told him no thanks, that I really needed to get to Fort Benning right away. Nah, he said, and that was it. We drove to a worn down apartment complex, where he told me he was picking up a regular to keep me company. I didn't reply. What could I even say? I wasn't raised religious, but I was praying to God for some kind of miracle. Out came a woman who looked a bit like a cliche prostitute, tube top, mini skirt, smudged mascara, and an unlit cigarette hanging from her lips. Short but ratty bleached hair, pockmarked face, cheap purse, and I have no idea who or what she truly was. But she got in the front passenger seat and lit her cigarette. She turned to me and said, Don't worry, he's cool. We're cool. Ah, uh, okay. That definitely helped. I had never considered jumping from a moving vehicle before, but even if I wanted to, the back doors were child safety locked and I couldn't open them. Trust me, I was trapped like a cage animal, just waiting to die. I felt so stupid, so foolish, sitting in the back seat of a cab with no idea what to do and no idea what was going to happen to me. I kept trying to rationalize it, downplaying the situation in my mind. I was too afraid and frozen to actually do anything anyway. As we were driving around, the girl was telling me about the driver, how he was ex-military and had just started this cab business. What a down to earth fun guy he was and how lucky I was to be picked up by him. How I was cute and young and everything was cool, cool, cool. Her words were a bit slurred and I knew she was either drunk or high on something. I didn't really want to know. We pulled up outside a small blue house sometime later, an hour before the break of dawn. And the driver told the girl to keep an eye on me while he went inside. I'm in full blown panic mode. The suspense of it all making it so much worse. The girl offered me a cigarette to calm my nerves. I wasn't a smoker, but I said yes. She got out of the cab and opened my door stumbling a bit before sitting on the curb and lighting another cigarette. She lit mine and I sat next to her. And I started thinking about whether or not I could outrun her with my heavy backpack and how long the driver would be inside for. Without me asking, the girl told me the driver was inside showering in preparation. I asked what he would be showering and preparing for but she kept repeating how he was cool and how much fun we were going to have and how cute I was. Then she said, Ranger Cab, because he was like a ranger or something. Or maybe that was his dad. He's a good looking guy, military muscles. God finally answered my prayers when the girl slumped over and passed out on the grass. I saw the track marks on her arm and guessed heroin. And apparently, the driver was inside taking a shower and wasn't about to come back in the next few moments. I grabbed my backpack and ran like hell. I don't exactly remember what happened after I started running. I know I took off as fast as my feet would carry me and that I didn't dare stop to catch my breath. One minute I was sprinting for my life, lungs on fire, and then I was trudging along with tears in my eyes as I walked through the Fort Benning gate with my military spouse ID, asking how to get to the base hotel. Honestly, I wish I knew how I got there. I was in deep survival mode and didn't stop to process any of it until I made it to my room. I don't know if someone gave me a ride, if I followed a map or what. I never blocked a memory out like that before or ever again. I told my husband everything when I finally saw him. He didn't believe me. I probably wouldn't have believed me either. 
His lack of trust made me think no one could take me seriously. So I never went to the police. I still had the number I dialed saved on my call history. I knew the girl called it the Ranger Cab. What I didn't have was the confidence or support to report it. Sometimes I think back to that day and wonder what would have happened if the girl did not let me out of the cab and if she hadn't have passed out on the ground and if the driver had never stopped for a shower. It's one mystery that I do not need the answers to. No wood, no wood. When I was eight, my family decided to take a summer vacation and take us to a big famous water park a couple of hours away from home. It was me, my older sister who was 11 at the time, and my little sister who was five, and my uncle who is paraplegic, and his girlfriend. We get to the water park, and my uncle and his girlfriend end up staying at the cabinas at the very entrance of the water park, due to the fact it was the only place with shade, and he had no intentions of getting in the water with his wheelchair. So they let us go off on our own all day. Big mistake. Since there were only either single or double person tubes, my older sister decided to get on one with my younger sister and let me go on one alone, but just hold on to theirs. And that worked for a little while, but we got to the lazy river that went around the whole park. And at the end of the river, they made it like very fast and crazy with waves crashing into you and stuff. I ended up letting go of their tube and flipping out of mine. By the time I even realized I had lost them, I thought it was no big deal, and that I would just find them soon enough again. So I'm trying to get back onto my tube. And for some reason, I just can't do it. A man notices me struggling, and decides to come and assist me. I finally get in and thank him and try to float away. But he hasn't let go of my tube. Instead, he starts talking with me and asking me why I'm alone. I explain that I lost my sisters. And he suggests that he gets on the tube with me because he doesn't want me to get lost or drown. I say, okay. And we get on a tube together. He starts forcing me to ride all the slides with him and talks to me about how his hotel room is not that far. And he has a whole bunch of toys I would love to play with. I actually started getting really interested. Because I don't have many toys. And the ones I do have are broken from my sisters. He says that we can get on one last slide. And we can head over there after. I agree. While waiting in line, he starts acting really giddy and weird. He keeps swimming under our tube and would play with my feet and legs and told me they were pretty. There was a young couple behind us who was watching all of this unfold. And I guess they could see the discomfort in my face because they tapped on my shoulder and asked if I was okay. And if I knew the man, he tried answering for me, but they cut him off and said they were talking to me. I reassured them that I was okay. But it was seeing the look on their face that made something click in my head and say that whatever was going on with this man was not okay. Once we got off the slide, I told him that I had to go. And once we got to the opening of the river, I wanted to just get on a single tube by myself, because I needed to find my sisters. He tells me that I can't do that. And he needs to watch me. So I can't leave him. As soon as he said that, this fear just came over me. And I ducked out of the tube and started swimming. When I looked back, he was right on my tail swimming after me. I ended up swimming to the entrance of the river and got on a single tube which he ended up grabbing and flipping me out of 
saying I needed to get on a double tube with him. I did not feel safe anymore. So I ended up running out and running to my uncle and his girlfriend. I didn't tell them what happened, just that I got tired of being in the water. After sitting there for a while, I saw no signs of the man. And thankfully, my sisters made it back to the cabina safe and sound as well. And we all left together. This happened to me when I was 10. I grew up in a military family and lived in the Middle East for a significant portion of my life. Because of this, we frequently traveled to different countries because of the low cost and proximity. On this particular vacation, we flew into Cairo, Egypt, the kidnapping capital of the world at that point in time, for a long weekend. We only lived about two to three hours away, and it was a late night, and we were staying at the Marriott Hotel, which had a taxi slash shuttle service that was supposed to pick us up. For some reason, our driver never showed. So we were forced to find regular taxis to take us there, which took forever that late at night. We finally found one that was offering us a pretty good deal. They don't run by meters, Instead, they just give you flat rates that they choose and headed towards the hotel. Out of nowhere, another taxi basically T-bones us in the middle of the road, causing us to stop. There aren't really defined roads in a lot of Arab places, so it isn't really that surprising that we got hit. In Arab nature, the true drivers get out of their car and start yelling at each other, and that it was each other's fault and looking like they were going to throw hands. Eventually, they got back into their respective taxis and parted ways. My family and I were completely taken aback. We had been in Egypt for less than two hours and were already having quite the adventure. We finally got to the hotel exhausted. It must have been 3 a.m. at this point, and our driver helped us get our bags out and get settled, and told us that he felt so bad about the car accident that he offered to pick us up the next morning and take us to the Great Pyramids, which was on our agenda for a super cheap rate. My parents agreed and decided on a time for him to come, though I can't remember when. Fast forward to the next morning. Everyone is ready for the day, excited to see how crazy it was going to be. Our driver was outside waiting for us, leaning against the car like someone in an old movie, right when he said he'd be there. I'm a blonde haired blue eyed girl that had a deep tan at the time. And being in Egypt, that was a rare sight. When the driver saw me in the daylight, he gave me the creepiest, most unsettling look that sent chills down my spine even as a 10 year old. I knew something wasn't right with him. Nonetheless, we got into his taxi and headed towards the pyramids. He continued to try and talk to me and joke around with me the whole ride. Something I found to be extremely creepy and bold since both of my parents were in the car. We get super close and there's an entrance that people can go through and walk the long distance to the pyramids. And there is an entrance taxis can use to go through. You have to pay to see them, strange but true, and our driver keeps making jokes about my blonde hair and blue eyes, and bringing up that he could get me into the pyramids for free, so my parents wouldn't even have to pay the extra ticket price. We laughed it off, and my parents paid him and said thank you, and began to exit the taxi. I don't remember how it happened, but at some point after I got out of the car, he did too and directed me towards his trunk. I was confused and thought we had forgotten something. So I stayed behind as my parents walked towards the gate to get whatever I thought we had left. The driver popped the trunk and there wasn't anything in there. He grabbed my arm and put a hand over my back trying to push me into the trunk and said, I'm getting you in for free over and over again as I resisted. Naturally, I freaked out and screamed out to my mum and dad at the top of my lungs, terrified. 
When they heard me and noticed I wasn't behind them, they started sprinting back to the car. When the driver heard me scream, he immediately let go of me, closed the trunk, and drove away, just as my parents started to run to me. I was crying my eyes out, terrified out of my mind, knowing that an Arab taxi driver tried to put me in his trunk and drove away the second I screamed for help. It's scary to think what could have happened if he'd been stronger and more prepared or faster. He's the reason I'm still terrified of taxis, Ubers, lifts, and of any car service of that nature. I grew up in a small town in Texas. We lived in such a small town that everyone knew each other. And even if you didn't know someone's name, that at least their face was recognizable or familiar. Also, I grew up with three other siblings, and we would all walk to and from school together. At the time of this memory, I was a young seven year old boy. And I remember it clearly being an intensely hot day. For reasons I can't recall, I was walking home alone that day, which was highly unusual and rarely ever happened. We didn't live too far from the school, but we could take certain tucked away routes that we perceived as shortcuts. This particular route was occupied by just a few houses, and most of them were empty. So it was usually a very quiet, inactive area, with little chances you would even encounter cars driving by. I remember thinking it was so hot that day, and my backpack was so heavy, and I couldn't wait to get home. Halfway to my house, quietly out of nowhere, I hear a car slowly driving behind me. After walking for a while, I finally turned around to see it was a small black car, and I could barely see that there was more than one person in it. Being a very shy and anxious kid, I tried to ignore it and keep walking, but it continued to slowly trail behind me. Part of me thought that this was all a prank. When my family first moved to this small town, we would get teased a lot for being the only Asian family in town. After what seemed like the longest and most awkward minutes of slowly being followed, I started to feel uncomfortable. So I stopped walking and stepped further aside to see if they would just eventually pass me. Even at the time of this happening, I never thought I was in danger because this small quiet town was known for being very safe. And like I said, everyone knew each other. The car then slowly drove up to me and rolled down the passenger window. There were three young men in the car. They weren't teenagers and looked to be in their twenties. I remember being caught off guard by not recognizing any of them, which was very strange for this town. The guy in the passenger seat then said with a smile, Hey, do you need a ride? Still being ignorant and not sensing any danger, I thought it was so tempting because it was so hot outside. Regardless of actually wanting to get in the car, I just said, What? He began to repeat, Do you want a ride? Then the guy in the back seat of the car began to open the back door and let me in as he grinned at me. Once again, even though I actually wanted a ride home, I just said, What? All three of them smiled and chuckled. The man again said, Do you want a ride? With a smile. At this point, I was so embarrassed and anxious. Once again, I just said, What? The silence in the background was interrupted by the sound of a screen door opening in the distance. I could see a familiar elderly woman just looking at us from her door. Looking back, I think she did this to let them know of her presence and possibly scare them away. Because this was obviously 
a very sketchy scene that she was witnessing. I turned back to look at the men. None of them were smiling anymore. They all looked serious. The guy in the passenger seat said so seriously and abruptly, get in the car. It almost felt like a scowl. I felt like I was being put on the spot and could feel a strange sense of urgency. So naturally, I became even more nervous and once again just said, what? I then hear the woman's screen door shut and the elderly woman was now standing on her porch, making her presence even more evident. The men were all clearly very annoyed and the man in the passenger seat just said, forget it, as the guy in the back seat shut the door and they quickly drove off. Still being completely oblivious to the danger of the situation, I remember thinking as they drove off, dang it, I could have gotten a ride home. Which is both funny and scary to think of today. I then turned to the elderly lady on her porch, and she gave me a gentle smile, and I shyly smiled back and continued to walk home. It was years later that I realized how shady of a situation this was, and I'm so grateful to the old woman who practically scared those strange men away. I was so close to willingly getting in their car, and if she wasn't there, who knows what these men could have done when they lost their patience. It gives me chills today to think of what may have happened if I got in the car with those strangers. So thank you, kind elderly woman. And to the three strangers in that black car, let's not meet again. This happened on Halloween when I was about 11. My friend and I decided to go trick or treating. Yeah, we were a little old, but we just wanted some free candy. I lived in a very nice neighborhood. One of those ones where everyone gives you the full sized candy bars so it wasn't unusual to have a lot of people come there for trick or treat. However, that also meant that there's about an acre of front yard for each house. So it took about three minutes to walk between each door. It was a good night for Halloween weather wise, not too chilly, not too rainy or anything. This is important later. So it's approaching 8.30 PM. And after hanging around on the golf course and appreciating our candy haul, we decide to start heading home and call it a night. The street I live on is a gigantic U shape, like a little over a half mile walk from the top of the U, down the bend to the other side. We were walking towards the end of the U, further from my house, as we wanted to take the long way, since it was such a nice night. It was about 9pm now, so no one else is really out anymore at this point, and people turned off their porch lights, the universal sign for no more trick or treaters. That's when we notice a lone white van parked on the street. We made a joke about how it looks like the stereotypical kidnap vans with the painted windows. That's when we notice it shift out of park and slowly creep down the streets towards us and park at the next house. Oh, they must have kids trick or treating. It wasn't uncommon for people to drive their kids from house to house, since they were so spread out in our neighborhood. But given that it was 9pm, and with nice weather, it struck me as a bit odd. We checked every few minutes, and it seemed to just be stopping from house to house like normal. We turned around again and kept walking at a leisurely pace, gossiping and whatnot. That's when we hear the car squeal as it moved forwards down the hill and parked again. This time, only about two houses away from us on the opposite side of the street. Again, weird time to trick or treat, but whatever. That's when we realized there were no kids getting out of the van, not once. Now this was before my first phone, a red and white Samsung Propel since it was 2008. 
We were only 15 minutes from my house, but a bit disturbed. So we walked to the nearest door and rang the bell and stuck our bags out in an attempt to act normal. A woman opens the door just a crack and proceeds to berate us for trying to trick or treat at this hour and then slams the door before we could even say a word. Okay, thanks lady. We turn around and the van is right there, parked in the wrong direction on our side of the street. The windows are tinted so we can't even see the guy driving. Trying to keep our cool, we casually walk away from the door and up the street to the cul-de-sac loop that's on the side of the street that makes up the bigger U. If you cut through the loop and hop a couple of fences, you can end up at my back door. The van goes the same way. Now we know he's following us since there's no reason for him to go up these side streets. We break into a sprint and I am by no means athletic, but I hopped those fences like an Olympian. We run inside my house, lock all the doors and freak out while we sit on the front hall. Not five minutes later, the van slowly drives down the street past my house. We stress eat our candy and think of what could have happened if we had not have been aware of our surroundings. I live in a major city, in practically the pit of hell state, born and raised here. I am very familiar with my surroundings. I'm also aware to the fact that my city is one of the worst hubs for human trafficking and living here can be very, very dangerous. Despite all this, I've taken pride in knowing that I do everything I can to remain as safe as possible. I've had close calls before. Shady landlord gives a stranger copies of my keys and a man tried to enter as soon as I was alone and other horrifying tales and consider myself an avid murderino. I'm pretty prepped. At the time, I had two things of pepper spray, one in my favorite jacket pocket and one velcroed to my desk at work. I also had two trusty pocket knives, one always on me, one in my car pocket door. Oh, and my taser never leaves my bag. I avoid shady situations and despite being a small lady, I know my stuff, yay for self-defense. My point is, I'm a very paranoid small chihuahua and I still get into scary situations. Now onto the story. It's summer and hot as hell. I've got a date with my favorite gal pal and I swing by her place to pick her up. She tells me she had a job interview to go to first and I agree to go with her. No big deal. She's a sweet, tiny thing from a small town in the Midwest and very new to city life and the wild things that can happen here. As we drive into a different city, I ask her about the job. It's a modeling gig. Oh, cool, for who? I found an ad on Craigslist. It's just sports clothes. The Craigslist thing sets a small distant alarm off in my head but I push it to the side. Where the heck are we going anyway? When we pull off to a Starbucks a bit outside the city, the alarms in my head become a little less faint. Relax, I tell myself. I've gone to legit job interviews in coffee shops before. There's always been a good reason. We arrive first, late still, but end up waiting about 15 minutes. Kind of weird. The cat's relieved we're not the rude ones when she gets a text saying he's here. I look around the Starbucks and outside the parking lot, trying to figure out who the mystery man could be. When I notice a tall, well-dressed man step out of a black SUV. He smiles at us and he approaches and I figure that's our guy. I could have sworn that SUV had been parked there for a while. I asked Kat if she wanted me to step in line and grab her a drink, 
but she practically begs me to stay with her. Okay, I can do that. I don't think it would look very professional, but I don't protest. The man named Jack leads us to an isolated table outside and doesn't say much about my presence other than it was okay for me to be there. I get on my phone and shoot a text to my fiance explaining where I am and what I was doing. He shoots back a be careful all in caps and I sit there pretty to watch the show. Jack had this strange accent that I couldn't place my finger on. Looking back, I'm not even sure it was real. He starts asking Kat the usual questions. And I notice she's absolutely bombing the interview. She doesn't have much experience and didn't bother to bring a portfolio. But despite this, he doesn't seem to care. The alarm in my head is much louder than a whisper, but it completely blares when he asks if she'd be comfortable doing lingerie shoots as well. Dear sweet cat say she doesn't have an issue with it, but would prefer to mostly do sports clothes like they had discussed earlier. She asks to see some of his work and he pulls up a lingerie Instagram. All lingerie, no clothing at all. He holds it in front of her face and pulls it away immediately. And when she asks if there was more she'd be doing, Jack goes, that was it, and hurries the conversation along. He says, we need to go right now to his studio at a place he briefly mentioned the name to to sign papers and get everything squared away. It had to be done today. He's not working tomorrow and his co-workers will not do it right. I absolutely hate everything about this. And I'm trying to glare some sense into her, but nothing is getting through. Kat agrees and he turns his attention to me. Do you want to be a part of this too? I immediately know that nothing about this is professional. I look down at my beat up docks and green cargo pants and shirt that has flames and a slightly edgy logo on it and I can't help but scoff. That's not really my thing. I'm just the ride. He studies me for a few seconds and then says we can all ride with him, directing his attention to Kat. No, I don't wanna leave my car. We'll follow you. He looks offended that I butt in, but asks where we parked. Right in front of the store. I got it. I pull Kat up to the Jeep and make sure we walk behind him. As soon as we get into the car, I lock the doors and try to keep from freaking out. We are not going. This doesn't feel right. What about the lingerie? Everything I say she has an excuse for. We pull out of the parking lot and I follow Jack's SUV. But the whole time I'm trying to figure out how to get out of this. Kay doesn't like the lingerie. But this could be a door for her, she says, and she desperately needs the money. What if it is legit? He was alone anyway. You have your knife and spray, right? Of course I do. But I'm five foot two, and this man's six foot three. And Jack could very much have friends. And I wouldn't want to possibly kill or be killed. I realize Kat is batshit. We drive along as I try to talk to her and start driving out into the desert, the middle of absolutely nowhere. There's a divider in the road that prevents U-turns and I get an eerie feeling that Jack knew to take us this way. I'm absolutely desperate at this point. I pull up my phone and snap a picture of Jack's SUV license plate. I upload it to Snapchat where friends can see it. And Kat starts getting uncomfortable once she realizes how far we've driven. The name of the place he mentioned springs back into my head. And I know it's familiar from somewhere. A commercial jingle that's distant but catchy. It's a restaurant or hotel or something. He wouldn't have a studio there. Please just look it up. So she does. 
it's a casino. Unless this man had rented out a space, he wouldn't have a studio there. It's not consistent with the information he gave us. Kat is freaked out at this point. I tell her that this isn't uncommon, and that he was trying to confuse us the entire time. Throughout the entire interview, she had a confused and hesitant look on her face, like this wasn't what she was promised or expecting at all. Kat finally agrees that we need to get out of there, and I start to breathe easy again. I notice that every five minutes or so there's a break in the medians. It's a rough, quick stop and turnaround, but I'll have to do it. So I do it, and we absolutely gun it. Kat gets a call from Jack, and she ignores it. I convince her to call back, and she gets nothing at all. Like the number had blocked her, it didn't go through. I tell her to take a screenshot of the Craigslist ad, but she can't find it anywhere. It's like every trace of Jack had disappeared. We go back to her apartment, and I tell her that she needs to report it. She promises she will, but later, because she doesn't want her husband to know. He didn't even know she had this interview to begin with, and she didn't want him to know what happened. If I hadn't have driven her, if I hadn't have driven her, she would have gone alone, without telling a soul and who knows what would have happened. I tried not to scold her too badly, but I just reminded her that our city was very different and much more dangerous than where she's from. Sweet cat, I hope you're a little more awakened to the world, and I'm sorry for that. It's been a few months since we split ways, and I'm worried over all the oblivious, crazy things that you get into. Since the incident, I now have three pepper sprays, one for the car, and a new pocket knife to carry around. Thanks, Dad. She's gorgeous. I'm almost four months pregnant, and now finally ready to get out of this damn dangerous city. Please, 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 dear listeners, be safe out there. It's such a scary world, and be damned careful with Craigslist. Jack, if you're really the scary guy my gut deemed you to be, I hope we never meet again. I come from a chaotic upbringing. I was born and raised as a child in South Korea. And I later moved to Australia with my mother, having lost my father in a homicide. The next few years of my life in Australia were difficult. Meeting and making friends was difficult in the early noughties particularly since I was quite nerdy and didn't speak much English, something most Australian kids at the time did not relate well to. One of the scariest moments from my life was when I was aged 12. At the time, it did not even occur to me how close I came to potentially losing my life. My mother and I were on a road trip heading south from Melbourne to stay on the southern coast. We had stopped one evening at a small, well-kept caravan park. The caravan park was quaint and beautiful. Neat grass, nice flowers, frangipanis blooming, and a small creek which ran along the edge of the premises. It reminded me of home. I spent some time walking around on my own, as my mother was taking a nap. I discovered a game and pool room. I went outside and spent probably a good hour playing pool by myself and generally just mucking around when a young boy came in. I was very shy, and so was he, but we eventually talked for a little while and became friendly. I do not remember playing any games with him, but I do recall him being pretty nervous. He kept asking me if I wanted to go back to his caravan as his parents were making dinner soon. At first, I was not interested, and said no. We spent some more time doing things, and talking as it got later. He became pushy, and asked if I liked cakes and lollies. I said of course, that much I do remember clearly. 
I followed him to his caravan, which was much older than ours and quite dilapidated. He asked me to wait outside while he talked to his parents. I waited patiently for a few minutes until the door opened and a larger older man with glasses and no shirt opened the door and asked if I would like to come inside for cake. I was scared, but I remembered feeling like I had to, like it would be rude of me to leave. As I was walking in the door, I heard a man behind me shout, Hey, what's going on here? I was quickly grabbed from the collar of my shirt and pulled inside. The man then quickly tried to lock the door behind me. However, the stranger was too quick and burst into the door and took my hand abruptly and pulled me outside. And we frantically ran away. The man asked which unit room slash caravan I was in and took me there right away. We went inside and my mum yelled at him asking why he was there. I was hiding in the corner crying while he explained what happened. We packed up and left immediately. I was already heavily on anxiety medication after what happened back home, and we never spoke about it alone again. My mother claimed it was something I should talk to my therapist about. Every time we all spoke about it, my mother would leave the room. It scared the hell out of her, and I did not really understand why. I guess at that age, it's difficult for the brain to comprehend the reality slash potential of the situation. Looking back on it now, it utterly scares me to the point of losing sleep. I was 14 when this happened. I had a pretty solid weeknight routine. I would go to practice, come back at around 8.30, and then ride my longboard about a mile down the road to a local Walgreens. I did this so I would have snacks for my inevitable late night of Xbox I had ahead of me. One night, I got home a little late, so I left at nine. I had been in my new, less sketchy neighborhood for about a year now. I usually ride on the road, but my gut told me to stay on the sidewalk. I hadn't even made it to the main road yet, and I heard a car behind me. It slowed to pace me. I had a feeling that something was about to go down. So I tested the guy. I stopped and did a 180 extremely casually, gave my board a little push and looked over my shoulder. He's reversing. Crap. I dip fast, picking up my board and go full sprint. I didn't want my cause of death to be wheel bite. I get about a block away and jump into some bushes next to our house. And I waited there for no more than 30 seconds before I heard a car slowly rolling towards me. They pass and turn right. I get out of the bushes and make a stupid move. I go to double check to see if they're gone. I dart across the street and peek around the corner. I see their brake lights then I see the white reverse lights come on a second later. You've got to be kidding me. I run back around the corner at God's speed, realizing my only chance is to get onto the main road. There's too much traffic there for this guy to do anything. So I sprinted there at full speed. I figured I got to top speed and he would have to run me over to catch me. He can't stop his car, get out and jump me if I'm running at top speed. I made it there, losing him at some point along the way. I don't know when. I never looked back. As it turns out, there had been multiple attempted kidnappings in that area that month. This story isn't actually about me, but my mother. We lived in Michigan, right in the border of Ohio. So it only took a few minutes to travel to Toledo. Our hometown was kind of a podunk middle of nowhere. So we would have to go to Toledo for any shopping. 
One day, she went out to this strip mall kind of area. Very sketchy, but also busy. So there wasn't ever any real reason to worry. She's on her way into a store. My baby sister at the time in tow, and this red panel car pulls up right in front of us, blocking her path to the front door of Target. They slide open the door and asks if they want to sample their perfumes. My mother is 90 pounds soaking wet and way too polite for her own good. She smiles and politely refuses and continues to walk into the store. On her way out, she's walking back to the car. The goddamn panel van and the dirty old couple block her path to the car and slide their door open again. Want to sample our perfume? This time my mother doesn't answer and proceeds to walk around the rear of the vehicle. The man puts it in reverse and the woman asks again, want to sample our perfumes? My mother immediately starts dialing 911 and the van peels out. The operator had said that they had calls multiple times today about the van and that there were reports of them kidnapping people who would actually sample the perfumes. This story to this day still scares the crap out of me. Not only for my mother's safety, but for the safety of my infant sister she had it with her at the time. Needless to say, I don't think she wants to meet them again. This happened at school when I was four or five. I remember that I spent the day at the zoo with the rest of the class, and we were returning to school on the bus. So the bus finally stopped three or four meters away from the school doors, and everyone got off the bus to join the class. It turns out that I was the last one leaving. Even the teachers had left. So I was about to enter the school's playground when a woman got out of her car and called me right in front of the open school doors. Hi, sweet boy. Do you want to go to the zoo with me? At this moment, I had a weird feeling. I knew something bad was happening. How could this woman know I went to the zoo? And why would she ask me to go with her? I couldn't think. I was paralyzed and she kept inching closer. When she was about two meters away from me and she walked up to me, I felt a strong grip on my wrist and got heavily pulled into the school ground. I looked up and saw my teacher, even more scared than I was. She looked like she was gonna cry. She ran into the school as fast as she knew I could run without looking back. Today, I still don't know what this weird woman wanted and if she really followed me since the zoo, but whatever. I hope to never encounter her again. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. Lots of tales today with plenty of information to take away from. Always be safe and careful out there guys. You never really know who you can trust. If you liked the video, please do not forget to drop a like and leave a comment with what you thought to let everyone else know in the comments section. That's always a real help. Something else I can recommend wholeheartedly is if you're new here, why not subscribe and press the little bell icon to be notified every time I post. I do post at roughly the same time each night, so be sure to get your nightly spooks in. If there's a story that you would like read on the channel, feel free to send it to my email or post it on my Reddit. Either are fine. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Please stay safe out there. Stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.